Well, hello and welcome. Greetings and blessings. Thank you for joining us today on this particular uh, installment of our Bible study this week as we continue our walk throughout the book of Hebrews. I'm so glad that you're here with me and I'm so excited to be in this book. I prayed, to be honest with you, for years to be able to go through this book in Bible study, but I had to wait on God's timing. And what better time than to go through the book of Hebrews while we're in the midst of a pandemic? I love the book of Hebrews because the Hebrews, the book of Hebrews takes the whole Bible and sums it up. It tells you what the Old Testament and Old Testament uh, practices, rituals, uh, ordinances were all about. It perfectly explains who Jesus is, what the kingdom of God is all about and what is expected of us as kingdom constituents. The book of the Hebrews tells us who we are. And I know you can find that in every book of the Bible. But the book of the Hebrews is specifically written to the Jewish audience who would have understood the law so much better than Romans or Corinthians or the Galatians. Uh, it takes the the it takes everything that the Jews would have understood at the time of reading and it perfectly explains what Jesus is all about and God's plan of salvation. All right. So on last week, we dealt with harden not your hearts. Jesus is the one where our writer is encouraging the Jewish audience to to not reject the gospel. Don't reject the message about Jesus. Don't reject God's salvation of your souls as your fathers rejected God's salvation back in the time of Moses. And they did not enter into his rest because of their unbelief. Unbelief will keep you from being saved. It will keep you from entering into the rest of God. But we said on last week that we're talking about two types of rest. All right. So I want you to join me in Hebrews chapter number four. And I want to read the first 11 verses for our hearing. If you have your Bible, your uh, Bible app, whatever the case may be, uh, on another device, not the one you're watching this on, but if you have your Bible or Bible app, I invite you to join me in Hebrews chapter 4 as we read verses 1 through 11. Let us therefore fear because, because of the forefathers who had died in the wilderness uh, because of their unbelief. Let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, nor being mixed with faith in them that heard it. They heard it, didn't have faith. For we which have believed do enter into rest. As he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise. And God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein. And they to whom it was first preached enter not in because of unbelief. Again, he limited a certain day, saying in David today, after so long a time, as it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. There it is again. He's doubly warning us by quoting the scripture. If you will hear him today, harden not your heart. For if Jesus had given them rest, this is Joshua, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? There remaineth therefore rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also have ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. This Hebrews chapter number four. Verses 1 through 11, as we continue through the book of Hebrews, again, last week we dealt with hard and not your hearts. 
Jesus is the one. Today, I want to deal with R&R, rest and relaxation. <laughs> oh, that sounds good. Rest and relaxation. For those of us who take a vacation, whether you take a vacation where you don't have to spend money or you take a vacation where you spend a little extra money, we look forward to the day that we can get away from where we are so we can be at a place to rest. If you're like me, you put your phone on silent, you mute your notifications, you make sure that you can get in the emergency re uh, messages, but you make preparation. You let people know who know you that you're going on vacation. Don't contact me unless it's an emergency. Basically what you do is you try your best to make preparation so that when you go into that place of rest, that you can enjoy your rest. Don't that sound good? <laughs> and here we are in the middle of July. And many of us have gone on vacation or maybe planning vacation before school start back. Um, or you just take a short break to go somewhere again where you don't have to spend money. Many of us can understand the need, the want, the importance, the benefit of taking a break. Well, I want to let you know that God condones taking a break, having rest. But his rest is so much greater than that what we can do for ourselves. Here in the book of Hebrews, chapter number four, the writer is picking up on where he left off in Hebrews chapter number three. This is one letter to the writer. To us, it's chapter and books. But he's continuing the conversation about rest and saying that we need to take heed and we need to have, uh, uh, we need to be fearful, careful about not being in the same place that our forefathers were in. Don't neglect what they neglected. Don't miss out on the rest that they missed out on. The only way to enter into God's rest is to believe. Now, the Old Testament, we must keep in mind, is filled with types and shadows. In other words, you get a, 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 a small scale replica of what God is doing on a much larger scale. If you know people who uh, have a hobby of putting together model cars, or if you've seen model cars, you know that they look beautiful. And a real model car, one that you spend money on, these people will make sure that they give every detail in that model car that you see in a real car. This is not a Hot Wheel that you buy from Walmart, where if you can even open the hood on the Hot Wheel, you just see a little plastic mold. It looks like a motor, but you can't take out individual pieces. But on a real model car, every piece that is on the vehicle that it duplicating is in that model. Every single piece of that engine you can take out. Every single screw is replicated. Every hinge replicated. OK, a model car is made to look just like the real deal. The only thing is you cannot get in it and drive it. That model car is a type and shadow of the real deal that it represents. So in the Old Testament, we have a model of what God is doing on a much greater scale. And the model that he uses in this scripture is of the children of Israel entering into the promised land. And their entering into the promised land was to duplicate a rest that God calls for his people still today. They were able to go into a promised land, part of the covenant that God gave to their father Abraham. 
And when they entered into the promised land, they would find that the vineyards had already been planted, that the livestock were already in their pastures, that houses were already built. OK, this was the land that was promised to him. And whether people agree with it or not, this is what God gave to the children of Israel. But they had to drive out the enemy. But. If they had faith in God, it would not take so much effort on their behalf as it took faith on their behalf. And through their weak efforts, God would do miraculous things. They would not lose a human being, would not lose an animal as long as they walked in faith. Now, the forefathers in the wilderness had a problem trusting God. God had shown them so many times how he was willing and able to provide for them, to defend them, to protect them. OK, God showed them even while Moses was alive, how they were able to win battles just by faith and obedience. But they still found reason to complain a bit against God, same as we do today. If he doesn't do what we want, when we want it done, we start complaining against God and these people did not trust him. They didn't believe and they were not able to walk into the promised land. For us, believer, we must have faith in God. It is our very life. In Romans chapter one, verse 17, he says that the just shall live by faith. And this is where you see the righteousness of God in us, that we live by faith. The just, the justified, those who are made right in Jesus Christ, we live by faith. Believer, if we're going to enter into the rest of God, into the promised land of God, into the promise of God, the first thing that we must get is that we must have faith. Now, when we look at verse number eight, it looks like the writer is talking about our Jesus, our Messiah, our Savior. But this is the Greek name, Jesus, which is the same name as the Hebrew name, Yahshua, or some say Yahshua. Jesus and Joshua have the same name. The name that was given to Jesus is not unique, but names are not labels in the Bible. I need for us to remember and Union Springs knows I teach this all the time that names in the Bible carry meaning. You name this for a reason. And isn't it something that Joshua, who is a Christ type, who is a model car of Jesus, has the name that he has? His name is not by mistake. His name was Hosea. Hosea. His name was Hosea. Hosea. But he's come to be known as Joshua or Yahashua. Jehovah is salvation because he's the very one who God uses to usher the people of Israel, God's people, into the land of promise. But he tells us that if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken uh, of another day. Now, to, to clear up this name, Joshua. Look to Acts chapter seven, verse forty five. And if you read that sermon in context, he says, which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drave out uh, before the face of our fathers unto the days of David. He is specifically talking about Joshua from the Old Testament. He's called Jesus in the New Testament. But you've got to understand the context of what is being said. So Joshua, a Christ type, was being used to usher the people of Israel into a place of promise. They had an earthly salvation. OK, but he's saying that Joshua was telling the people of Israel that there's a greater rest for you. Understand that God is with them. They have the Ark of the Covenant. They have their priests. But there still is no rest because they're not in a place of promise. They're not in that promised land and they still have the enemies to be dealt with. So it's not only it's only until 
the enemies of Israel are dealt with in the land of Canaan, that they are able to rest in that earthly rest. OK, even after they defeated their enemies and most of the tribes got their place of possession, their land of inheritance. Caleb said, let me go and fight for my place. And he went and he dealt with his enemies by the grace of God. But even then, there was a greater rest. All right. Now, Hebrews chapter 11, 13 through 16. I hate to jump ahead in the same book, but we'll deal with it in more depth. Then uh, Hebrews chapter 11, we deal with what we call the hall of faith, the heroes of the faith, the cloud of witnesses. They, 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 the writers talking about the cloud of witnesses. And he says in verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and was persuaded of, of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. You cannot confess that you are a stranger or a pilgrim on earth if you think it's all about living on earth. If you're not looking for another land, if you're not looking for a greater promise than just having earthly rest, this scripture would have uh, uh, no, 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 no weight. They thought that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth because of another promise. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to return. So if Canaan or Israel, uh, the promised land was what it was all about, then they wouldn't seek another country. And the only thing that they would have looked for was to come back from where they were driven out of. But now they desire a better country that is an heavenly, specifically heavenly. You've got to believe in heaven. Scriptures teach us specifically that this is not about a land on earth, but they desire a better country that is in heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. This is not an earthly city. This is a heavenly city. We are trying to enter into a, an eternal rest. Okay? For if Joshua had given them rest, this word rest is a different word that is used in verse 9. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. The rest in verse eight and all these other scriptures, except for this here, uh, verse number 10 is talking about being able to cease to be able to stop to cease from your work. But verse nine, there remained therefore a rest to the people of God. This is a Sabbath. Both these word rest are working hand in hand with one another, but he's using uh, on purpose a different word. All right. In verse eight, then he's using in verse number nine, because he's letting us know that there is a rest where you cease from your labor. But there's also a rest where you cease from life on this earth. There's a rest that we enter into that is a totally different type of quality from the rest that we understand where you're just going on vacation just to relax, to rest and relax. It's good to know that we can rest and relax, but it's better to know that there's a rest and relax from from this earth. Because once you come from vacation and you come back home, it's back to reality, baby. You got to get back on the grind. You got to get back to work. And even if you're retired, you got to get back to cleaning house. You got to get back to cooking food. Amen. You got to get back to to doing things with our hands, laboring on this earth. But he's saying that there is a greater rest than just ceasing from your earthly labor. Now, there are two types of rest that we get in our Jesus. Our Jehovah is salvation. I want us to understand that we cease from a type of labor that we did in our previous life. Jesus cries out to us, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Is he talking about the labor that we work with our hands? Is he talking about the type of labor, amen, where 
uh, uh, we just go to work. No. When we live a life of sin, we're living a life of labor. It's why the, why the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. All right. We are under a taskmaster, a hard taskmaster. We are under a slave owner. Under a cattle driver, his name is Satan, Lucifer. This is why he tells us in the previous two chapters that we are being freed huh, from the bondage of Satan, that Jesus had to defeat the devil. Because he was our slave master, our hard task master. And you might have enjoyed the life that you were living, but it was only going to pay you back in death. The wages of sin is death. Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I'm here to let you know that you can have rest in this life by resting in Jesus Christ. You can cease from that labor, that labor that you labored under Satan. You can cease from the labor of trying to win God's favor, trying to win over God's mercy with sacrifices like they did in the temple system, because none of that will ever work for you. But Jesus came and he labored for you and we can enter into his rest. See, the people of God, the people of Israel were able to enter into the rest of God from an earthly standpoint because it was God who defeated their enemies for them. Even though Israel might have been on the battlefield, they really didn't have to fight. They really didn't have to die. They didn't have to put their lives on the line. All they had to do was believe on the word of God and God would defeat their enemy for them. And they were able to enter into a land already prepared for them because it was promised to them. And they rest. They cease from the labor of planting seeds, cease from the labor of breeding cows. You understand what I'm saying? Oh, I'm getting excited about this. They were able to cease from that labor. But in Jesus Christ. Christ, he fulfilled the law for us. Now, I want to break this down so that we can understand, because a lot of folk that are not Baptists will say that Baptists say Jesus fulfilled the law as to say you don't have to live holy. But I want you to know I'm not Baptist. I'm Christian. I'm not. I'm one Lord, one faith, one baptism. All right. I pastor a Baptist church. I belong to a Baptist church. But we here at this Union Springs Missionary Baptist Church, we believe what the word of God says, one Lord, one faith and one baptism. We're here because we stand on the solid word of God. All right. Now. <laughs> Starting to get excited. Let me slow down. <laughs> Jesus fulfilled the law in this. That Jesus completed the atoning work for those who would believe on him. You would think that because he plucked corn on the Sabbath that he broke the law. But he gave us the greater understanding that man wasn't made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. And Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. When I say he fulfilled the law, I'm not talking about everything uh, that the law of Moses said that he did perfect, even though he was perfect and he did everything perfect. Specifically, I'm talking about the atoning work. Everything that was necessary to be done to win salvation for us. He lived as a perfect man. He was tempted in all points like we are yet without sin. And more importantly, because he lived holy and he was totally flawless, blameless, without blemish or spot. He was the acceptable sacrifice. He's the acceptable high priest. He is the acceptable scapegoat. And he is the acceptable substitute for man as man. Jesus completed the atoning work to win salvation for us. There is no lamb that you can get to lay on the altar that will finish what Jesus started. Because when Jesus was on the cross, he himself said, you got it. It is finished. There's no work that you can do 
that would earn God's mercy. You only find mercy in Christ. There's no work you can do to earn God's grace. You only find grace in Christ. We'll get a, a little glimpse of that next week as we close chapter number four. And you'll get a lot of that as we go towards Hebrews chapter number 10. But there's nothing that you can do, believer, to add to the work that Jesus did on earth and at Calvary. When he says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We can rest in his finished work. There's no more work that we can do to earn salvation. There's no symbol, there's no sign, there's no labor, there's nothing that we can do to earn salvation. For the Bible declares, and I believe that all our righteousness is as filthy rags. You can get the holiest of y'all. Because <laughs> I'm not going to put that, I'm not going to put that on myself. I'm not holy by myself. But you can get the holiest of y'all. Put all of y'all together in a room and all your righteousness is still as filthy rags. Jesus completed the atoning work for us. That's what the law was all about. All of those laws that Moses wrote were to teach the people holiness. Huh? And the people had to live holy and the priests had to live holy so that when they offered up their lamb and when they brought forth their scapegoat, that God would accept them in that type and shadow system. But that was never meant to be forever. We can rest in the finished work of Christ. Aren't you glad about that? You can rest and relax in Christ. Excuse me. You can take a forever vacation in Christ while we're here on earth. We rest in his labor. But there's yet another rest that remains for the saints. There's a Sabbath where we can rest in total completion. See, when God rested on the Sabbath, he completed the work of creation. And J. Vernon McGee says it like this. I love it. He says that God provided all the atoms needed for creation. And God is not going to provide not one more atom in creation. Times may change. Seasons may change. We may do things that's destroying the earth, tearing the earth down. But there's not going to be another atom provided. Atoms may get rearranged. Atoms may. Uh, uh, well, yeah, he says atoms may get rearranged, but not one extra atom is going to be added to creation. Everything that God did in six days, God completed. Isn't that good? So when God finished his work, he stopped. He didn't stop being God, but he stopped creating in the earth. Now, for us spiritually, J. Vernon McGee also says this, that Second Corinthians five and 17 says that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away and behold, all things have become new. He is creating new beings every day. New spiritual beings. But. As far as creation is concerned, God is done. He ceased from his labor. There's nothing else that has to be done. Guess what? When we enter into our heavenly rest, nothing else has to be done. When we enter into heavenly rest, nothing can mess it up. God has already prepared a city. <laughs> oh, my goodness. He's already prepared a place. Jesus told us that in John chapter 14, I go to prepare a place for you. Where I may be, that where I am, there you may be also. My goodness, in my father's house, many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Earth is not going to be resurrected. There's a city prepared for us already, believe it. Hmm. And he tells us 
Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. Verse 10, he that is entered into his rest is also ceased from his own work as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. That almost sounds like an oxymoron, if I'm using the right word. That's ironic that he would say, let's labor to enter into rest. But it's also ironic that people go to war to bring about peace. Let us labor to enter into that rest. Listen to this. What is our labor? How do we labor to enter into that rest? Romans 12 and one. Listen, even though on the day of atonement, the high priest went into the Holy of Holies, and he offered up that sacrifice on that one day of the year. Every day, the priests were burning offerings. They were washing. Okay. Every day there were sacrifices being brought up. Romans 12, chapter number 12, verse number one. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Our high priest, he's already put himself on the altar as our atoning sacrifices. But now we're priests. First Peter 2 and 9, ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who have called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You and I, believer, we are a royal priesthood. Our high priest has done his job, but every day we ought to be cleansing, washing, putting off, laying our bodies on the altar as living sacrifices. That is what we do by faith. We obey the Lord. We obey God. We obey, we obey Jesus by walking in faith, walking in obedience to his word. But let us labor to enter into his rest. He's given us his spirit, his power to be able to do that. And then lastly, let me share this with you. I'm not talking about labor to get God's attention. I'm not talking about labor to earn salvation. You can't earn it. Jesus has already bought it for us and he offers it to us as a free gift. As I think about Mary and Martha, sisters, and Jesus was in their house. Martha was in the kitchen doing busy work. Mary was laying at Jesus' feet. She was soaking in Jesus. She was cultivating her relationship with the Lord. Spirit gave it to me like this. Martha was trying to get things to Jesus. Mary was trying to get to Jesus. Can I say it again? Martha was trying to get things to Jesus. Mary was trying to get to Jesus. That's a difference, beloved, in our labor. Are you trying to get things to God? Are you trying to get God's attention? Are you trying to do things so that God would approve of you? Or are you living as he says to live because you want a relationship with him? One labor will do you no good. Trying to earn God's favor and attention. But trying to get to Jesus, getting to know him for yourself. Hmm. My goodness, you will grow in your relationship with him. You will be changed by him. Laboring to enter into his rest ultimately is trying to get to know him through his word, putting his word to practice. And we get to know him through his word. Are you trying to get things to Jesus? Or are you just trying to get to Jesus? Let us labor to get to Jesus. And as we get to Jesus, the more 
close we get to Jesus. Hallelujah. The more you will find that you're able to rest and relax in his presence. God bless you. Lord's willing, we'll see you on next week.